get started and then um, if I stop making sense at any point or if we run out of slides and there's still time and people want to hang out, um, please shout out some questions or type them in the chat and um, maybe Nathan can read them from the chat. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll keep an eye on the chat and just to let everyone know we are recording this. Right, so translation behind the scenes. Uh, the questions that I got uh, pretty much boiled down to these. So how are manuscripts found? What, like, how do we do manuscript study? How is it possible? How do we know about old languages and old handwriting? And then what does the actual process look like? Is it a team sport? Uh, Julie asked, what is most tedious slash fun? Julie, how did you know? That there was something that was both tedious and fun, uh, aside from this entire field. Um, and Julie also asked a trick question: When did when is it done? Um, so, how are manuscripts found? Um, that middle picture doesn't look nearly as nice full screen. Gosh, um, the first example I have is the picture on the left: the guy in armor with orange tentacles is from the Gladiatoria at Yale. And this manuscript was, it was lost during World War II, is maybe the where that story begins. And then it resurfaced on the art collector's market as individual pages. And uh, Paul Mellon, who would eventually donate his whole collection to Yale, found all of the pages at art auctions in the 1960s. So this would have required a combination of subscribing to actual paper catalogs and also networking to find people who could read their own paper catalogs and listen to market rumors until he was able to buy all of the pages. And you can see in this photo, the guy with orange tentacles, his page is not full length because these were sold as individual pieces of art. So some of them had the text cut off the bottom to make them just a picture. Uh, once Mellon got all of the pages, he then had it bound back into a book again. Um, you can go visit this manuscript whenever the world is open and you can visit things and places again. Um, you may need a, a letter of introduction or something to the librarian, but you can go to the reading room and actually hold it in your hands and see how bright the orange really is after all these centuries. Um, and then the, the middle and the right hand of this slide are the Floris manuscript or the Paris Fiore. Um, the thing in the middle is the part of the spine with the name on it. It's only actually less than an inch thick, I think, which is why so few letters fit. And then the Senio page looking like maybe someone put their drink down on it on a hot day. Um, this manuscript made it into the National Library of France when a major family collection was donated, like their, their whole 500 year library just donated entirely to the country of France. And it got imaged at some point in the 20th century and noted in a catalog, that catalog got imaged onto microfilm. And uh, some of you may have met Dr. Master Ken Monshine uh, was going through this uh, microfilm catalog looking for just, is there anything interesting here that no one knows about and no one's talking about? And recognized that Florius de Arte Luctandi might be a Latin translation of Fiora de Battaglia. And so this might be a Fiore manuscript that nobody knew about. He requested to see the microfilm of it and what he got was not a Flores manuscript, was not a Fiore manuscript at all. It was something completely unrelated that had been mislabeled with the right spine label for this manuscript. So he actually had to request that the library, the National Library of France re-image the entire thing after convincing them that no, this microfilm was not good enough. It really wasn't, it was the wrong thing. Um, it's now been digitized in full color in pretty decent quality and we can all study it. Um, 
most of the pages are in better shape than this. We'll see some more examples of those. So I, I think neither of these is really typical, but those are the, the two stories I know off the top of my head about how do we find these. Um, and, and so the, the generalized answer is how do we find these? People look for them in extremely tedious ways. And if that's something that you're interested in doing, there are lots of especially European institutions that have digitized their collections and they've cataloged them, but they might not say super cool HEMA book in the title. It'll say, you know, unknown manuscript about swords and that's it. And someone needs to go and find them. Um, who knows how many could be lurking out there. Uh, here's what digitizing looks like. These are two different methods for varying amounts of fragility in a book. You can see one of them holds the book in a cradle to keep it from falling open. Um, yeah, that's, that's digitizing. Um, so the next question was, how can we read things in 500 year old languages? as well as uh, have I translated anything in a language that's significantly different from the modern version? Um, the answer to how is people have been writing down older forms of their language for as long as there have been older forms of languages, basically. But in the case of German, the most famous example is the, I think I wrote it down. Am I gonna be able to pronounce this word? Maybe not. Um, the Deutsches Wörterbuch by the Brothers Grimm, the same famous Brothers Grimm. Um, also, I've skipped a giant chunk of my notes. Let me rewind. Uh, so in terms of like how different are the languages now from when they were used in the medieval period? For German, I can't really say as much. It, it is very different from what you learn in like a high school class. Um, I, I, I translate Latin, so uh, in, in the case of Latin, what I learned in high school was classical Latin, so like the Latin of Julius Caesar, that's the first century BC. And in the following 13 to 1500 years, things did in fact change pretty noticeably. It's totally comprehensible, but it's not the tidy monolith that my Latin teachers told me that I would be studying. It, it's not even a monolith at all. So often it's only about as different from classical latin as american english is from british english where it mostly makes sense but there's some things that are spelled weird and the prepositions aren't quite right and it, so if you talk to someone who speaks uk english they'll say things like well the two kinds of english aren't so different to each other and you'll go with two aren't they different from each other and you know, maybe you have an American dictionary that won't tell you what lorry means or why pants is differently funny in England than it is here or what they mean when they say pavement. So it's sort of that about that level of nonsense. It, it's mostly good, but, um, but sometimes you discover that the dictionary you have is not the dictionary you need. Um, there are also cases where uh, the language sort of drifted as it got used, and then something would get a new consistent usage. So if you look this up in only the classical dictionary, it won't make any sense. Uh, a, an example from English would be, if you look up the word hopefully in an old dictionary, it will tell you in a hopeful way. But that definition won't tell you anything about what it means in a modern sentence because now we use it at the beginning of a sentence to introduce an idea that you hope is going to become true. So it's a completely different kind of adverb and that kind of shift happened a fair amount also. Uh, so I discovered by sort of being dropped into hot water that I needed to learn about medieval Latin and now I have a much better dictionary. But even that there's still, it was a living language for medieval people. And it's very much not now. So there will be things that just aren't in the dictionary and we have to guess. And that's when it gets very exciting. 
Um, so to return to the Deutsches Wörter book, um, the Brothers Grimm of Brothers Grimm fairy tales began making this dictionary in 1838. It was finished by different people entirely in 1961. And there are continual ongoing update projects. Um, I think the last update was released in 2012 and there's still another one in the works. Um, the handwritten text you can see at the top of the screen is from their first draft notes. And the photo below it is I don't know, maybe from the 1950s. Um, that's a team of researchers who are working on this dictionary. It's the largest and most comprehensive dictionary of the German language in existence and records high German vocabulary going as far back as 1450, including etymology attested forms, variations, kind of like the Oxford English Dictionary, if you've ever used that for English words. Um, so that's the biggest and most famous. There are a few others like Lexer. Um, if you look up Lexer German Dictionary, you won't have to suffer me pronouncing words badly. Um, but someone who was so famous for making dictionaries that he became known as Lexer, the word man. Um, that has a specific focus on courtly medieval German, so it doesn't apply to everything, but it is definitely medieval. Um, the one other medieval German dictionary of particular interest is uh, Scares, uh, which is this column of text on the left. This dictionary from 1781 um, is especially interesting for us because one of its source materials was a Faulkner treatise that's now lost, but is quoted extensively in the dictionary. So not, not enough to piece it back together, but uh, an interesting thing in studying HEMA books is that they'll, they'll pass in and out of the historical record. So sometimes we'll know a book got destroyed Sometimes we'll think there was only one copy of something. This guy wrote one book and that was it. And then you find a dictionary quoting a different book where the quotations don't line up with the known copy. Uh, so that's the definition for Spreckfenster. Um, but also you'll note at the top that's translated into Latin. So, um, I think, well, I'll talk later on about working on teams, but we found it very useful to work on a team with someone who does Latin and someone who does German, because a surprising amount of the medieval German dictionaries, you have to know Latin for them to make any sense. Uh, another piece of how we can still study and translate these languages is that there's a whole field of historical linguistics that examines how languages change over time which includes both changes that are recorded where you can see you know, books from this century spell things one way and books from a later century spell them differently, but also based on those known changes, you can extrapolate a pattern and then use that to explain things that aren't recorded. Um, so a, a very small example would be in, in the Zettel, if there are places where a modern German word has a B, but the Zettel version might have a P. That's a very well-established shift. That those two letters will slosh back and forth. Um, and you can also see that when it, maybe you try to read the Zettel with modern German phonetics and it doesn't rhyme anymore. Those rhymes are an artifact of the language changing where you can see if, because we know that they were supposed to rhyme, we can sort of guess how those end words would have been pronounced and then guess at how the other words next to them would have been pronounced if they had the same vowel shifts from historical to modern. Um, which for German gets particularly interesting and complicated because then the words get combined together and it shifts the letters a little more. So the scarce dictionary mentions Spreckfenster. It defines it only as a fencing word, which is a surprise because I, I imagine many of you have heard that it means speaking window in English. And the speaking window is an architectural feature often in 
uh, monasteries where there are people who are supposed to stay cloistered and not interact with the outside world and there'll be this special very small window where they can talk to people or when you have the great big door and then it's got the little door in the middle and you can peek through and tell people no I won't let you in out of the rain um, that is also a speaking window but it turns out from looking at this dictionary that's a sprack fenster with an a so that the fencing one is Sprech Fenster with an E could mean that there's a pun happening here, that there's a different root being combined with Sprech Fenster. Um, since Sprech Fenster itself as a whole word, our best guess is um, that the Sprech could be, if it's not speaking, it might be spraying and a spraying window doesn't make any sense at all. Um, Translation dictionaries are often built on earlier dictionaries where you know you have a dictionary and you know from working with texts that there are words that are missing and so you add them to it and then you create a new edition of the dictionary. That's the easy way to make a dictionary. Um, the Grimm Brothers Dictionary is a case where it's a dictionary that's not based on an earlier dictionary. So the research that went into that was finding a, a whole corpus of German and then making a list of all the words in every book in that library and then going back and looking at the context for each of those words and writing down what each word means in context based on all of the examples, which is why it took over a hundred years to finish it. Um, this photo of some very, very, very orange books um, is a similar dictionary, but for Latin. This is my personal copy. This is my uh, Hema translating reference shelf. Um, you can compare the uh, Forgang Meyer there for scale. It's a pretty big dictionary. It weighs 30 pounds. Um, and this is the Dictionary of Medieval Latin from British Sources, which was a 20th century project to do that same process, but for medieval Latin texts in British collections. Uh, there are also historical translating tools. And there are actually way more of those than have been published and modernized. So when I'm looking through manuscript collections and digitized images, usually for something else, I fairly often, like a couple times a year, will find a handwritten manuscript that's a translation aid. Um, and this, this sort of charming page, which is a great combination of pretty but also messy um, is one of those. This is a 15th century Latin dictionary for German speakers. Um, and you can see the red at the top is in a different handwriting from the main text in brown because different styles of handwriting used to be specifically associated with certain languages. And so you would actually change handwriting if you were quoting a word from another language. Um, the brown is in German and the red is in Latin there. Uh, I think it was Julie who also asked, um, when a language is so different from what's studied in school, how does a person get the confidence to work on these difficult materials? Um, and well, what I've put in my notes is the most important source of confidence is not something that comes from books. The most important thing is being willing to give it a try, especially knowing that it's going to be really hard. Because it, I don't know, it, you have to be willing to take on, I guess, looking at the book and figuring out what it is you need to learn and then learning it while you're working. Uh, and so there's a, it's a special kind of adventurousness, I guess. Um, and I don't know, I think from talking to people who do translations, no one ever feels like they're really good enough to do a perfect job. So if you think you might like it, dive right in. Just like any language learning process, there's going to be a phase when all you can recognize is I, you, he, she, and 
but you can't remember how to get directions to the bathroom. Like it happens in conversational French. It also happens with medieval Latin. Um, and, you know, I, I've been doing translating since I was 16. Um, and I can't do it without a dictionary literally in my hand, in my browser tab all the time. And in fact, I use a dictionary that helps cheat, like it figures out the difficult grammar for me. Um, so yeah, it, the important confidence is being willing to try and knowing that whatever you do, you're going to have a stack of books next to you the whole time. Sword books are actually easier in some ways than other translation subjects because the vocabulary is somewhat limited and predictable especially when you're working within a known tradition, uh, you know it's gonna be about swords. There's gonna be a lot of body parts. The words are going to be about two people move toward each other and they do something and then one of them hurts the other. And so that closes off a lot of options for different meanings. And in German, the verb tenses are simpler than if you have you know, a complicated historical narrative that has people quoted talking about their present but in your past. Um, Latin is never so lucky as to have simple verb tenses, but the German is fairly straightforward. Um, but you may be getting a sense that in addition to the actual language skills, there's this other very important skill for manuscript study, which is reading the handwriting. Um, the scholarly name for that is paleography or very old writing. Um, in paleography, different styles of handwriting are known as hands. And it's not really like we talk about someone's handwriting now and it's their personal handwriting and it'll tell you things about their personality and their education. And it's rare to find two people who write pretty exactly the same. But in the days when books could only be made by copying them by hand, there were professional scribes who would learn specific hands that were readable or fast or a particular kind of pretty or were associated with a specific language. Um, so this page that's not quite good enough resolution for using on a slide, um, this is a, a teaching book for a scribe. You can see that there are repeated letters in several places because they're practicing writing the same letter exactly the same. And I suspect this text might not be actual German. It might be partly nonsense in order to practice putting different letters next to each other. Um, so in the medieval era, like if you needed a book made, you could go to the scriptorium and you might discover that they say, well, the thing you want is too many pages. It's going to be way more expensive than you thought if you want it in nice handwriting. But they'll give you a price cut if you're willing to have it in a less readable hand that's faster for them to write and they can fit a lot more letters on the page versus something that's more formal or like this has really big gaps in between the paragraphs. Um, this is another thing where I was totally dropped into hot water on this. Um, this is the first page of a medieval manuscript that I ever worked on. And I had no idea what it was going to look like. I knew what an illuminated manuscript looked like. And I knew that a combat manuscript was going to look different. As it turned out, the image quality was a way bigger issue than the handwriting. Um, this is a this might even be a photocopy of a low resolution microfilm that is all that any HEMA people had to work from at the time. Um, once you squint hard enough, the Latin hand, which is the upper section of text, has some pretty recognizable letters. It only has a few abbreviations. Um, the German is another story. I actually can't read this German at all. <laughs> Um, fortunately, we now have better scans. I was amazed when I saw these. I like this is barely even recognizable, um, but this is much more readable. So this is a scan from five or 10 years ago um, at much higher quality and in actual color.
Uh, this is the uh, Vienna copy of Paulus Hector Meyer. So it's sort of within the German Lichtenauer tradition. And this particular copy has, um, Meyer's previous books have been everything he knew about sword fighting in German and then the same thing, but in Latin. And then he made a third copy, maybe to keep for his personal collection that had both on the same page. Um, I often wish that the German wasn't such a total mystery to me, but I'm kind of glad I don't need to work with it all the time. Uh, and this is the Latin only copy of the Paulus Hector Meyer book. I really like this hand a lot. This one is much easier to read for all that it has more abbreviation marks. Um, I won't get super deep into that, but um, most medieval hands, but especially Latin, they don't like to write all the letters, whether because they just have to write a million letters today and maybe they can cut a few off or because they need to fit things exactly into the length of one line. Um, we jokingly refer to them as squiggles when we work on these. You know, there's a thing for, I left a letter out, it's probably an M. And there's one for, I left a letter out, it's probably an R, or it's a P and an R in some order. Um, as well as there's a, a Q with a three attached to it, and that means and. Um, there's a few others that mean whole words. Uh, but yeah, that's Paulus Hector. So having done some of Paulus Hector, when I started looking at Florius, I thought it wasn't going to be too bad because these are these letters are actually separate from each other for the most part. And this turned out to be extremely challenging. Um, a particular feature that we were not expecting is this is Italian semi-Gothic. Um, which is a transitional hand from Gothic to humanist and includes features of both. So there's not just one set of letters in play. There's like one and a half. There's an extra half an alphabet that might be turning up. Horrible. So in a, a, a text that's in a Gothic hand, you might look at a letter and say, well, this must be a C and an L next to each other, but too close because that's not what a D looks like. Except in this hand, there is that vertical D as well as a slanty curvy one. So you can no longer tell from, I don't know, from that letter set, which things might be impossible. Um, these are two of my favorite slash least favorite pages from Florius. Uh, the one on the left is the quadruped page. Um, we worked on this for hours trying to figure out why it seems to say I will ride up beside the resonant haunches of your quadruped and we're going like all right so a quadruped can make noise maybe be resonant but the haunches I don't know that's what the grammar says um uh Boston Army Zare scholar uh Jay Lachese I think, I hope I'm not mispronouncing that too badly, also did a great research project comparing this picture of a horse's butt to the same horse's butt in the other Fiore manuscripts in order to determine what order they were made in and which was copied from each other. Um, on the other side is what seems to be maybe Fiore himself taking on three legendary heroes, all of whom are on horses and he is on foot. That's just how cool he is. Um, this one also, if you look at the text at the top, you can see there's like little tiny faint letters up above. And that's where a later reader wasn't sure, like struggled reading this and wrote in notes for themselves about this is a proper name in two places. So this is a, a very interesting example of, we know that someone was reading this after it was created, which is actually kind of unusual for Hemo books. And we know that they too were struggling with the Latin. In fact, there's, I don't know, between three and five different sets of notes from people who struggled with this. There are some that are in Latin and some that are in French, some that were in French and then erased later. Um, if all of this is sounding interesting to you, but you're not sure you're ready to dive in, 
because there's not a lot of easy mode in HEMA texts. Um, the good news is there are actually free online tools and self-guided courses for learning paleography. So if paleography sounds cool and translation is scary, you can totally do paleography. There's even classes for it. Uh, there's my mouse. Uh, right, so this is, here's a, a blown up example of the first word of the second line looks like it says Dano Clavo maybe, which the dictionary reported was not a word. It might be Dano Dabo, which is a word. Um, Dano Dara is the infinitive, but also it means untie. Uh, Noda is like a knot. And we decided to make it dislocate because when you're untying someone's shoulder, that's probably what you're doing. Um, I don't know, this, this was a really hard text and someday I may go back to it now that I have a better dictionary. Um, next up is, so the translation process itself. Um, do I work by myself or with a team was one of the questions that you all submitted. I prefer to always work on a team. This here is an example of what working on a team looks like. I'm pretty sure Google Docs hates us very personally because of the tortures that we put it through. Um, this is a passage from the Latin Lev gloss, also from Paula Hector Meyer. Um, I don't know, it, it's kind of a mess. Working as a team is way easier with Google Docs than when we were circulating copies of documents with version numbers. Um, for me, I always like to work on a team. I feel like I get unstuck sooner. I need less editing later because we can kind of get one pass of editing out of the way by talking to each other and being able to say to each other, that's not actually English yet. We should keep trying. But as I understand it, that's fairly unusual that most translators work solo or mostly solo and then they have an editor at the end of the project as part of publishing. But also there are people who don't necessarily work on a team but will do only one step of the process. So like if you wanna get involved in this and you don't have a team to join, there are probably options. Transcription is the obvious one. And if you're interested in that, which an hour is probably your best starting place because everything is sorted according to whether it needs to be transcribed or have the transcription checked or translated or have the translation checked and other things. So you can just grab a page and give it a try. Um, if you know someone who you know does solo translation projects, you could also ask them, is there a step that they need help with? Um, maybe they need someone to read a thing and say, this is not English yet, which you don't even need to have studied modern languages, modern German to do that. That can be actually really useful to have someone who doesn't know German word order. And so can tell you, you've put these words in the wrong order entirely. Um, so what is the most tedious fun part of the work? The thing that is both tedious and fun is transcription. Um, because it's just writing, read the page, write the thing, read the page, write the thing. But also it goes pretty fast because it's, there's no grammar. And if you're familiar with the hand, you don't even necessarily have to be able to read the language. You can just put the letters onto the page. So sometimes um, Rebecca, my co-translator and I will dial into the call and go, I'm really tired from my day job. Can we just do transcribing today? And we just transcribe for an hour. And it's surprisingly fun and also totally tedious. Um, but the most straight up tedious is verb tenses. Um, it, sometimes we have to make a list of all of the verbs that are in the passage so that we can put the verbs in order according to what tense they are. And it, stick with German grammar if you can. German grammar is better. Uh, but the most fun, the most actual fun is words that have multiple meanings, which can either shed new light on a difficult technique or just sound ridiculous and goofy. So during the Flores project, our most fun day, 
was the day that we finished transcribing and we looked at it and Rebecca and I just started laughing and laughing and could not stop laughing and no one else in the room knew what was so funny because we would just keep going, no, lizards, lizards. Um, so the word, the Latin word for lizard is lacertum. This is also the Latin word for shoulder. I guess because a lizard is like a snake, but it has shoulders. But in a text that's about, you know, I'm gonna wrap my arm around yours and I'm gonna untie knots in your shoulder, this comes up a lot. And so one of our early drafts, instead of I'm going to dislocate your shoulder, had I'm going to twist your lizard. Uh, we, we have a lot of fun with that. Um, or this one is, I know, a little harder to read, but if you look in the lower left, um, it was another case of we just started cracking up and it didn't make any sense, but, you know, we needed to look up some words. And here the German says, uh, you know, this is good for opposing the ox. And the Latin has furore boum. <laughs> And so we looked that up and we got passionate love, large Italian snake. Uh, probably not what it actually says. On the other hand, the giant Italian love snake would make for a much funnier translation. Um, this is a sort of medium finish draft. Um, it's broken out by phrases because we find that just makes it easier and it's color coded according to whether it's you or the other person who's doing each of the verbs. Um, I don't know. It, <laughs> it feels silly to look at, but often translation is not the glamorous Indiana Jones. You know, the sun falls on the thing and you look at it and you can just read what it says. That literally never happens. Um, so there is the, the raging bull crouching love pox. And here is a more polished version of the same thing, but with its German. So this time the color coding is um, phrases that are the same in the German and the Latin. We've colored the same color. Uh, so Julie said, trick question, how do you know when you're done? The real answers I have are when most of the Hauptstücke can be read aloud and someone can hear it and go through the technique. That's the goal. Or when an objective uninvolved party looks at it and says, this is totally English. Because when we've been translating for a while, we can tell that it's not Latin or German anymore. We cannot tell that it's English again. Those are the real answers. But the true answers are, when I just can't stand to look at it anymore, is when the Florius was called done. Um, or when I stop asking, who wrote this crap? Um, I'm still saying that about this Latin love project a little too much. Or maybe the truest answer, when Michael Chittister asks, can you put it on which hour? And my immediate reaction is, no, I don't want anyone to see this. If I don't say that, then maybe it's okay to publish. Um, I think, yeah, that is the end of my slides. So I will unshare that. And I don't know, what, what questions do you have? Just gonna do a little wrap <laughs> those. Uh, you talked about a little bit about like medieval translation aids that show up. Uh, are those just dictionaries or like how do they work? There are dictionaries. There are also more like a vocabulary list than a dictionary where it's not full definitions, but something much simpler. Um, but also there are texts for teaching grammar and teaching rhetoric and that kind of thing, um, of which the most famous is from the seventh century, uh, the work of the Venerable Bede. Um, I don't know if this is as true for 
vernacular languages, which is the medievalist term for everything that's not Latin, um, because those wouldn't have been formally taught in the same way, but Latin was not a native language by the medieval era. And so it was only taught in school. So there had to be supporting teaching materials in each era. How many, um, what's it called, sort of texts are there like in the process of translation within the human community at any one time, what do you say? Uh, that's a very big question. Um, really, that's a Wichita question. Um, I think, I don't know, from, from just hearing people talking about translation projects, I would say there is probably at least 10 in the KDF community. Um, I know much less about other branches of HEMA, although at Fiore, I'm not sure there's a lot of ongoing translation work because there are only four of them. Thanks. Any other questions? Kendra, I don't remember if you said this or not, but how long have you been doing this for? Uh, I have been doing translation projects since I was 16, which was my junior year of high school. Um, I was extremely fortunate to meet Jeffrey Forgang when I was a teenager and get involved with what would become the Higgins Armory Sword Guild um, before it was called that and before anyone realized that maybe they shouldn't just be admitting 14 year olds into their pretending to kill each other club. Um, so that was <laughs> that was a little exciting. Um, but I had been then studying Latin for a couple of years at school and Jeffrey asked, did I want to do an independent study project because he was working on this book that had Latin in it and he knew I'd been reading Latin. And I think he had another high school student who was doing a similar project, but from the longsword. So uh, that was Lawrence did longsword and I did uh, several pages of the dagger. I don't, I don't remember how many, but um, uh, maybe like a dozen pages over the course of a semester. It was slow going. Um, and I don't know, I've kind of stuck with it ever since. I've never actually studied medieval Latin in a class. Um, I, which means I guess I'm self-taught at medieval Latin. Um, so I can offer that too as a message of empowerment. You don't have to have studied this in college or anything. It helps to at least have a friend who did, who can tell you what all the good dictionaries are. <laughs> because it would never have occurred to me that there were medieval only dictionaries until, um, until I heard someone talk about it. You can find some of my oldest teenage work on Wichtenauer still, I think. On the other hand, I can't exactly say I'm proud of it because when Rebecca, my current translation partner, first looked at it, she was reading a transcription and I had left a note about like, I can't read this. Who did this? What do you mean I can't read this? This is readable. <laughs> Anything else? Any so, particular page or passage you want to see? Sorry, go ahead. Um, wanted to ask, so are there any um, 
sort of additional insights that the language that the um original language gives on the actual mechanics of the fencing that you found um i don't know exactly how to phrase it sorry how to phrase um, the question sorry. that's okay uh sometimes um there are, there are many layers of meaning of course in language and it's hard to get all of those when putting it into English, and especially English that's for just anyone to read or HEMA people who haven't necessarily studied uh, German courtly love poetry or German hunting books or German cookbooks or all of these kind of things. And so the hunting one in particular comes up a lot because a lot of the special technical words in KDF also have meanings in hunting, where uh, ricin is, I believe, when, like when your dog goes and chases the animal. And vinden is when the animal is going back and forth to either side of the path trying to escape the dog. Uh, hangin is when you drop the dog's leash or the horse um, the horse's reins or a uh, falcon's jesses. So you release the animal to go and do its thing. Um, so that one's very interesting because it's a combination of you you like drop the leash and let it hang down, but also there's this sense of you're by doing that you give the animal its head and let its instincts take over. And hang in the sword action is when in the upper hangers you let gravity take over. But also, you kind of, I, I, I think of it, I think this is a cool image. Um, it's a thrusting position. So you're lining up your sword to let the sword's instinct take over and go right into your opponent. Um, and something like that is very hard to keep in the English and have it still be readable and have it still be like a single word that you can use in conversation. Um, this is something that we ran into with the Flores project. A lot of the words were just weird choices. It was sort of like, uh, if you remember being a kid who had a vocabulary test and you learned a new word and then you used that word every day for a week because it was the coolest word. And so there are four pages in a row where actions are described as, I'm gonna make my opponent gloomy. Gloomy is a strange choice. And it's, it's fiore, so it's kind of like trash talk, but the verb choices in the Latin are not just, you know, the Italian will say, I'm gonna throw you to the ground, your face is gonna hit the ground. But in Latin, the word for when the face hits the ground is also the word for when a wave reaches the shore, and also the word for when a vine clings to a tree, which is, it's fascinating. It's weirdly poetic. And, you know, I'm going to throw you so hard your face is going to stick to the ground like a vine sticks to a tree. It is kind of too wordy. Um, so things like that are sort of hidden in the original language. In the case of the Latin lev gloss, um, because we have sort of an exact parallel where we know that this German book and Latin book were created alongside each other to be the same content, we can look at sort of the space in between those two and when they're different to understand a little bit more like, you know, why was this particular word chosen to translate the German into the Latin? We may never know the real why, but the choice of a word that means twist, but also means curl your hair, and also means cook bacon, for Vinden might mean something, that all of those are actions where you're doing this. And maybe this action is part of Vinden. Maybe it's not. Um, I don't know. The, sometimes the word choices are strange and he's combining prefixes with roots that don't mean that, like they mean something else to every other Latin speaker. And then clearly they're being used here. So it's a little bit tricky, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, did that answer your question about secrets that are hiding inside the original language? Oh, yes, definitely. Thank you.
Thank you. Does anyone have a favorite uh, gloss passage they want to see what the Latin looks like? If not, that's fine. Also, you guys know how to find me. Um, uh, you can reach me by email or Discord. Like, if you have a burning question about a passage that you're stuck on, I don't know, shoot me a message. And we can try to see if there's something hiding in there that neither of us has noticed yet. All right, well, Kendra, thanks so much for coming out and uh, giving us this talk. This was really interesting, so. Thanks for inviting me. This was fun. Yeah, it was awesome. Thank you, Thank you so much. This is really well done, Kendra. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. So much. Thank you so much.